Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Fabulous. Good afternoon. Sorry for the delay. Welcome to Lightning Talks. We have five people doing six things, and first up is Sean. Hello, uh, I'm Sean. Um, so, DGIT is a multifaceted project trying to solve a lot of problems at once. Uh, the source package certainly is. Um, and so, I wanted to briefly talk about one of the things that DGIT makes better that is a reason why you should consider incorporating DGIT push into your existing workflows. So, one of the things that we offer our users uh, in our stable releases is that we say, look, we are going to make sure that you can do apt get source, apt get uh, build dep package name, and then it will build, right? That's one of the things we ensure, and it's an RC bug if that doesn't work. Uh, but apt get source is a pretty old fashioned way to get the source for something running on your computer. In particular, like you can't commit things and then revert them, you can't make branches, uh, you can't uh, manipulate the source in all the ways that you can with git. So it's often, I think, what people probably do is apt get source and then just commit everything to git. Uh, now, dgit clone is kind of a shortcut there. So dgit clone will apt get source and commit it to git, roughly. There's more stuff going on, but that's one way to understand it. Uh, and that's the git history you get if you type dgit clone when the maintainer just uploaded the package with dput. So it's kind of useful, it's in git now, so you can type git clean and that's pretty convenient. But I think we could do a lot better for our users. We could give them the whole packaging history and potentially even the upstream history, which makes it much more, uh, which is a lot of power for debugging problems on their system. So that's what you get when you do dgit clone when it wasn't dgit pushed. What happens when it was? Well, that's what you get. If someone, like I did, typed dgit push, then when the user types dgit clone, they get this rich history with all this useful information for debugging. They can revert an upstream change, for example, and then try and build it, uh, or you know, all that kind of stuff. And as you'll see, the dgit push command has gbp in it. Like this wasn't a like fancy uh, git deb rebase workflow or anything like that. All I did was drop dgit gbp push into my existing team gbp workflow. So if you're on a team that has a gbb paste workflow, consider incorporating dgit push and give this extremely useful thing to our users. Thanks. <laughs> right, uh, next up is Yudit telling us Debbie and Lenny work every penny. Okay, the main issue about having a talk about Debbie and Lenny is, will you be able to fill five minutes with it? But I'm prepared and I have a backup. So, who of you is still using Lenny? Who of you? Yeah. Who of you plans to use Lenny? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. So Lenny is not completely um, abandoned. Yeah, but back back in 2009, when it was released, everyone was using it. And now, 
yeah, you, you feel somewhat lonely about it. And of course, there are reasons for it. For example, it got um, security support uh, discontinued in 2012. And of course, it, it's missing a lot of fancy stuff like HTML5. This might not be an issue if you don't like videos. And even if you would have support for HTML5, probably you wouldn't have support for most of the codecs. And of course, you don't have this emoji thingies, which also could be an upside for you. The worst issue is that about, I think, 65% of the web is not usable for you because you do not have the support for the encryption. And you're missing recent CSS, which means the depconf page looks like this. And it's supposed, when it's supposed, <laughs> <laughs> and it's supposed to look like this. <laughs> Of course, it also has upsides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you spend a lot of time of to find finding workarounds, using chain root, trying to compile your stuff yourself. One of the possible solutions would be to make a Lenny testing zombie or something like this. But but this is gonna break, so best solution is just making a change route. Of course, this is going to be collapsed because the newer, the, uh, the, the bigger the gap gets, the more problems you get with running the recent Debian on the Linux kernel. So if you want to run Jesse, you need to install a kernel from, Deb, uh, from, from backwards, but at there will come a point when this will no longer be possible. And of course, you can run KDE and Firefox and stuff like this on crappy hardware. And it's, it's really stable. You don't get any updates. No one is writing software for it, so it's great. And of course, <laughs> you don't get any of the new bugs. There are lots of security bugs. I just reading, okay, it, the first version of the kernel it has it was 2012, so I don't care because I'm using Lenny. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun and maybe, yeah, some of you might, might want to try it. We have you for the first of two presentations. Mm -hmm. As I said, we have five people doing six things. Two of these are from Gunnar. Okay, this is not really for me. This is, I'm presenting a work I didn't do or that I took a very small part of. Let's subtitle DevConf videos. So, uh, in DevConf 13, Madame Zhu created this team it has had around a dozen contributors. Uh, it, is, uh, it has a uh, uh, IRC channel, don't worry, it's not high traffic. I think I have a month uh, worth of conversations on screen at any given moment. And uh, it has a mailing list, which I now see we should migrate soon to something more uh, uh, modern. Uh, you can find the Salsa project, you can find it in Amara. Amara is a, a framework for uh, subtitling videos and for making, uh, for, uh, uh, it's also used for making tra the translations. What is the motivation for this uh, uh, project? Well, it is accessibility. Uh, m uh, many of you have uh, suffered trying to understand somebody sp uh, speaking in broken English or speaking in incredibly fast English. So what we aim to do is to uh, uh, subtitle all of the 
uh, uh, all of the uh, talks, or some of them at least, because uh, it takes quite a bit of work. Uh, there are people with hearing problems, and there are people, well, not, not fluent enough to follow English, who may prefer reading it. So how this is made? Uh, I have, I differ a bit with uh, uh, Thomas Vincent, uh, who pr uh, prepared this. He says it's uh, three main steps. I have done it in two. Uh, uh, transcription and synchronization are two different activities. I have used usually Aegisuv, so I do them together. Uh, he pre prefers Amara, a web-based uh, tool. So it's first transcribing all the text and then uh, uh, cutting it to, to match and to be of adequate length of the, uh, of the uh, time uh, uh, part of the speech uh, takes. And then, of course, reviewing it. And of course, it's always better if uh, you do some work, somebody else will review it, it you, you get much more uh, things. So we had this amount of uh, uh, subs made for, for uh, well, e each of the last several DevConfs. Uh, sometimes, yeah, we do very little work. It's uh, sad that we only ma managed to do, say, one for DevConf 14. Uh, for DevConf 16, there has been a lot of work done but it, it, it has not been like deemed uh, publishable. Uh, I don't uh, have information on 17 or so, but well, there, there is work and this is hard work and uh, I think it's work worth doing. I should do, do more and so should each of you. So join us, uh, we, uh, I, I will try to uh, get you up to speed. The, maybe the best way is the IRC channel. It's basically watching the same very cool talks you, c you come here to, to watch or, to, or, or which you download somewhere uh, and make, uh, well, uh, watch them really slowly. Uh, of course, it's most important to keep this uh, work in mind. Uh, so if, if you are speakers at DevConf, make sure you use the microphone correctly. Attendees, well, we also want your questions, so wait for the microphone or go to the microphone before asking questions. And uh, that's it. Uh, uh, just as a last, uh, last point, it takes me usually around four hours per hour of video, which is not, not that much. And it, I, I think it's really a nice service we should, we should uh, try to have. Thank you very much. Do not touch the cable. <laughs> Next is Ian Jackson with a quick demo, which will take a moment to just change laptops. Very quick and very keen. Just one moment. Okay, so um, Sean's explained why you should use dgit push for Debian's users. I'm going to demonstrate why you should use dgit push yourself. You'll see here, I've just run the test suite. This is my real upload workflow. All I've done is resize the windows. So test suite has passed. Um, I look at my uh, Git K. Okay, test it is at master, great. I'll just change the, finalize the change log. I'll need a window for that. Just a moment, I'm gonna put down the mic and type. Don't normally use this terminal any later. Okay, so my branch is prepared. I just need to faff with my PGP key. There, it's a bit slow here because the uh, the Wi-Fi is a bit slow, so it needs to fart about slightly. Normally, this is a bit faster. By the way, the monitor here has gone. Oh, no, it's flickering. It's just always doing that. 
So this is a native source package. You can use this with any of the other workflows, like the GPP workflow that Sean was talking about earlier. Do I actually have Wi-Fi here? If I'm trying to do a demo up for an upload with no Wi-Fi, no, here we go. It's just double checking everything, checking my signatures, doing the stuff, all sorts of like frantic paddlings going on under the scenes here. I don't need to worry about any of this. There we go now, there it's pushing the Git objects to the Git repo server so that DGIT users get that history. There we go, now it's uploading to FTP master, it's made all the signatures, I'm just gonna take my key off. There we go, that's it, uploaded. By popular demand, Gunnar. Oh, you have to you have to take the white thing off. I think. <coughs> Meanwhile, anybody know any good karaoke tracks? Yeah, you seem to have a super. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to sh uh, show a, uh, a project I didn't do, it's not mine. Uh, it seems I'm not uh, doing anything, I'm just showing other people's work, and uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, this is not Debian related, but still I want to share with, uh, with you. Uh, um, uh, my Mexican friend in Japan, whom I vi uh, visited on my way here, uh, found, well, this, uh, you, you've all read about this uh, Scratch programming environment, which, uh, well, is very nice for teaching children how to, or teaching newcomers how to program in a nice, easy way, uh, without uh, syntax, only with blocks that are very, very, very hard to, to get right. The main problem with that is that it was uh, made in Flash, uh, hence it's basically dead. It's obsolete, it uh, runs on a non-free environment. So he made S-Found, which looks very similar, and uh, which adds several things. Of course, I'm not that familiar with it all, but say let's uh, just open this as an example, the Space Invaders game. Yeah, it even runs, uh, somehow runs. I don't remember the keys, but well, don't, don't worry. It runs. Uh, here you have the program. And, well, uh, I'll now show something that's uh, easier to, gra uh, to grab on a single. So let's see the, the classics, a Fibonacci example. Uh, one of the things that this does that uh, Scratch doesn't do is to handle the concept of uh, standard input and star standard output. It's implemented in JavaScript and can be run locally. I couldn't get it to run on the first uh, try, but I know it can. So this is... Um, well, the main program, and this is the function to calculate a Fibonacci. You can check. I mean, it's uh, quite simple to get right. Uh -huh. uh, if the value is zero, return zero. If it's one, return one. Uh, else, return the sum of uh, uh, one uh, of of e, uh, e minus one and e minus uh, two. So uh, I'm showing this. Well, the uh, running it is very boring. We all know Fibonacci, but. Uh, it's very uh, nice that it can show what this compiles to in JavaScript. So I, I think this can be used as a teaching, uh, a, a very good teaching uh, help. Uh, this is, uh, well, amigojapan.github.io slash has found, and he has, uh, well, the sources available here. And, well, I will be happy to relay any questions you have for him if his contact is not uh, displayed here. So that's it, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. We have our last speaker. It's Hector. He's requested a double slot, so I guess we'll indulge him. Oh, that's exciting. Um, right, well, come on up then. Here we go. Starting now. Hello, thank you. Hello, uh, speaking to many people here, are you able to see the slides? So. You. Well, I was uh, talking to some people here. I didn't have many, much time to prepare this, didn't have any pictures either. But I thought it was important to let people know a bit of the history of the Debian Embedded and the ARM ports. So uh, at the very beginning, it was uh, 1999, Jim Pick bootstrapped the Debian ARM port thanks to Russell King that was working, enabling support for the uh, RISC PC uh, on the upstream Linux kernel. And <clears throat> there was a lot of unsigned char and unaligned access issues to go through at the time. And that's what all the, st all the fun started. Uh, there was support for few few boards at the time, NetWinders, uh, it was a big platform, RISC PC, LART, DECUS N2100, which could also run a different ABI, which was the embedded ABI, the RML port. Are you able to see or not? Yeah. So um, the ABI port, uh, there was uh, Leonard Beitenheck uh, work on the port in 2007 as part of uh, applied data systems, and he did a build for uh, ARM v4T uh, using Open Embedded, help doing this work. And then Riku Boipio uh, announced the first RML build signed uploads build demon. And you can gather more information at the link at the, at the wiki page of, on the ARM a EABI port page. And we had uh, support for different hardware and the platforms, the main platforms, which include many different boards, were based on Orion uh, chips from Marvel, Kirkwood, Intel has the, their own ARM line, uh, IXP4XX and the IOP3XX, uh, which uh, this, this look was one of the popular platforms at the time. And then there was an emulator from ARM called Versatile. So the combinations in the kernel was like uh, exploding at the time, and the kernel maintainers were a bit upset of having to do different kernel build for every different hardware out there. So sidetracking from ARM, uh, we needed cross tools. And there was a, a cross tool chain was provided by Endebian. Um, there were some preleni tool, cross tool chains, 295, based on the two, uh, GCC 295 binary packages you could install. But then uh, MDBN worked on, um, well, Nikita Yuchenko created and updated some patches for cross GCC, what, uh, 3.x, 3.3. He was uh, trying to keep up to date those patches, and they were like getting rotten quite uh, easily. And then uh, myself, I pick up support for those in 2005 and uh, updating them for 3.3, for 3.4, 3 uh, GCC 4.x, uh, also have a cross GDB, which now we have GDB multi-arc that you can install from the archive, you don't need a cross variant. And we enable multi-libs support in the cross compilers. So. After a few years, 2014, I move on into other things and the cross tool chain uh, what got picked up by Guki and, and Marcin, which were working on uh, Linaro and enable multi-arc support and uploaded uh, to Debian. So the embedded Debian kind of, uh, mDebian kind of fade out and now it's got merged into Debian. And now uh, Matthias Kloss, uh, well, Klose maintains the GCC cross package as he can do uploads of the cross compilers and keep them in sync with the native compilers. So at the time we also on the user land on Debian, uh, it was, uh, there was 
re released 2000, uh, 2009. It was released in Debian Grip, which the, the purpose for that, it was filter the De uh, Debian binary packages, remove all the fat like uh, documentation and things that were not meant to run to be on an embedded system, repack the binary file and, and, and release them into some uh, repository available public a public repository so people could install that and a lot of innova innovations came from that uh, discussions at the time like a multi strap the package vendor uh, the package filters and others but and then uh, other like canonical for example pick up on the the package vendor idea and sto and push push it further but all the initial ideas were created uh, through through these uh, meetings, and with uh, Debian Grip, you could get uh, we cr it was a created multi-strap, which was another way to run the bootstrap, and um, you could come up with 56 megs of installed size, not compressed root file system, uh, uh, where when you multi-strap Debian, you could have 90 megs of a root file system. But if you run the basic debootstrap, you get 269 megs. Uh, one, you, you get uh, binaries that you can clean, and then instead it was like 2008 megs. And uh, uh, if you like migrate from uh, Debian to MDebian, the, you could get up down to 160 megs. So it was uh, quite a safe in the space. And then there were some ideas that uh, were not really ever released, Crash and Bake. Well, Crash, I think there was some, uh, uh, some pre-release that never... Crash idea was a cross-build, a user land replacing core utils with BusyBox, so it would be less than what Grip was. And Bake it was a, uh, a cross-build, a minimal user land, but uh, without updating capabilities, so you could just bake on the on a hardware, hardware like firmware that is not meant to be updated. So uh, this morning we had some both session at Debian Cross. There are some people that might be picking up on some of the ideas. I don't know if you're interested. The, it could be interest, interesting to see some work forward on this. And then the Debian HMHF. Uh, came on. Uh, I was involved with Constantinos Margaritis uh, in the initial port of the Heart Float. It was sponsored by Toby Churchill and Genesis. Genesis for the Effica MX devices. They have a net top and a, and a, a laptop or netbook. And then Linaro Canonical also helped a lot uh, doing upstream support for the Heart Float. There's also a wiki link documenting these things in, uh, in, in Debian, in the Debian wiki. Um, and uh, there was the initial support was meant for the Effica devices, so it was uh, running a Freescale MX5 chip. But later, thanks to Linaro, we got a unified kernel, and we were able to move to the ARM multi-platform, ARM MP kernel, with device tree support. And we only have one binary to build. and um, and run on any, any other platform. So that kindly uh, got happy the kernel maintainers. And finally, Debian ARM64. Uh, we, it was a migration from the 32-bit user land to 64-bit. And it was bootstrapped by ARM and Linaro internally. There was no hardware available publicly. And they were using fast models. And also later, they enabled Q QMU. And, uh, Later, we got some chips made and made available. It was a Juno board for ARM and XGen hardware. And um, that helped uh, bootstrapping the Debian port in Debian ports and later in the official Debian archive. There's also a wiki link there that you can access. And uh, now uh, we have a unified kernel for ARM64, but we have some different ways to run the bootloader. So now, you can run U-boot, you can run XCPI boot or UF, UFI. And thanks for being here, attending Lightning Talks and this talk. And if you want more info, you can uh, 
uh, search the ARM ports wiki, the ARM ports mailing list, and the embedded mailing list, which the embedded mailing list was uh, sidetracked by the bootstrapping, which the, the goal is to build Debian from sources, and the Debian cross mailing list, which is they're worried about being able to cross build packages. So you have all these mailing lists available and wiki resources. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We were meant to have one more speaker who on short notice is not available. I believe the gist of his talk was please join SPI. So on behalf of that speaker, please join SPI. Thank you all for coming to, wait. Uh, okay. This is very brief. Uh, right, so SPI, uh, I don't know if you know what, S who here knows what SPI is? Okay, so SPR is one of Debian's trusted organizations. It holds quite a lot of Debian's money, quite a lot of DevComp's money. Um, it's quite important. It's a bit boring, to be honest, um, but it has a, a, a release critical bug. The bylaws are a complete mess. They date from years and years and years ago. They were like some horrible hack for, by people who didn't really understand. It's terrible. We need to fix the bylaws. We have written new bylaws, but we need the approval of two-thirds of the SPI contributing members, which might be you, to get those bylaws through. Two-thirds of people have to vote in favor of the whole membership, not two-thirds of the people who are voting. So we're having a big drive where we ping all the contributing members. Every Debian developer is entitled to be a contributing member. People who contribute to Debian in other ways are often entitled to be contributing members of SPI. Um, we want, so we're working on removing the inactive people from the numerator, but we want to increase the denominator. We want the, the two-thirds to get two-thirds. We need lots of people who are interested enough, at least, that you'll go and vote in the board, the new bylaws approval thing um, when that comes up later in the year. That's going to be like a month or two. Uh, the new bylaws are pretty good. They've been extensively reviewed in public. Um, it's a complete rewrite, so asking for the diff is not really very helpful. Um, but if you want to um, know more about that, um, ask the SBI general mailing list, or ask me, or ask anybody with one of those SBI stickers on their laptop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See, I didn't have to do it myself after all. Um, yes, so thanks all for coming to Lightning Talks. See you at Lightning Talks again next year in Curitiba. Bye.